Welcome everyone. My name is Kara Zakavich and I'm the Child Injury Prevention Program Coordinator at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. Today we're doing a conversation on concussion. Miriam, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Miriam Beauchamp. I'm a neuropsychologist by training and a professor at Université de Montréal here in Montreal, Quebec. And I'm also a researcher at the St. Justine Pediatric Hospital Research Centre. I have a Canada Research Chair in Pediatric Traumatic Brain Injury, and I have a particular interest in concussions across the ages of children and adolescents, but particularly when they happen in young kids. Thank you. So awareness about concussion has significantly increased over the years, primarily with reports around concussion in sport. Uh, sport organizations have worked to educate those involved to recognize and manage concussion. And we've had awareness days, policies, strategies, information, resources, guidelines, all of these things have contributed to a greater awareness. And many more people are learning about brain health and preventing concussion. So what about concussion in children under five years of age? So at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute, we focused um, our website content on children under five. So first, Miriam, could you tell us what a concussion is? So a concussion is an injury to the brain and it happens when an external force uh, comes and hits the head or the body. So it can be a jolt to the head or, or a, a hit to the body that makes the brain move in the skull and the, the, the brain can come and hit against the skull uh, and that causes injury. So five and under, most of the concussions are falls. So they can be falls outside the home in the playground and things like that, but m most of them, many of them happen inside the home, you're right. Almost all of young children will bump their heads, especially when they're learning to roll, crawl, walk, jump, you know, achieve those developmental milestones. So for children, particularly under the age of five, what are those common symptoms and how long do they last? So I'll start by describing what we know are the common symptoms of concussion across the ages. And, and I'll tell you why I do that afterwards. But the symptoms of concussion um, are things like possible loss of consciousness, even if it's brief, um, altered mental state, which can be confusion, for example, or feeling foggy, um, headache, repeated vomiting, uh, dizziness, balance problems, sensory problems such as sensitivity to light or blurred vision, for example, um, but also uh, mood changes uh, and behavior changes. Um, so in young children, this might be seen as crying excessively uh, and um, being irritable um, and also problems sometimes with sleep so or altered sleep pa uh, patterns, which might be a symptom of fatigue, for example. So those are things that we know across the ages, even in adults, we describe these same symptoms. Um, however, in comparison to older school age children and adolescents, there's actually very little research on what these symptoms look like in young children. This is something that we're studying in, in our group at the moment, um, but there aren't very many studies out there that show us what the differences are uh, or that have tracked the symptoms in a systematic way from the time of the injury across the first few months. We believe that they probably have the, about the same pattern uh, of, of recovery and of, of showing symptoms. So um, that probably the majority will recover within a month of injury, and then a smaller minority will, will keep exhibiting symptoms up to about three months post injury. But we're still in, at the stage where we're conducting studies to really be able to characterize uh, that evolution. I can imagine it's challenging to characterize something that maybe is um, reported and um, particularly because children under the age of five maybe don't have the language to say what their symptoms are. Would that be fair to say? Yes, so that's exactly right. So the whole, there's this whole issue around how do you detect, how do you uh, perceive these symptoms in a young child? So children below the age of two, for example, who are pre-verbal, will not have any language to be able to say, hey, mom, I have a headache. <laughs> um, so their symptoms might come out, are, are most likely to come out in behavioral ways. So they might, as I said, cry excessively. They might throw a tantrum. 
They might be particularly irritable uh, one day because they're not feeling well, but they're not able to say that to their parent. Even kids older than two who have either, you know, emergent language or who are verbal will have limited vocabulary to describe these quite abstract concepts. If you think about dizziness, um, this is not necessarily a word that, you know, a three-year-old knows or is able to describe, for instance, or sensitivity to light or, um, you know, any one of those, uh, of those symptoms that I named are actually very hard to describe. So even in the slightly older kids, the preschoolers and toddlers, uh, we, we, what we see is that it's really in the behavior that we can see there are changes. So why is that, why is the change in behavior such a concur, uh, concerning symptom? Well, first of all, because it's, it's probably the most salient thing parents can detect, right? So, so we really want people to be paying attention to those changes in behavior. Um, but the other thing is, um, we, we think we, we see that there are changes acutely. So in the first hours and days after the injury, one of the studies we conducted, though, we uh, followed a, a group of over 100 kids with concussion who were a year and a half to five years at the time of their injury. And we followed them actually for almost five years. But what we noted is even six months after the injury, these kids were showing increase, uh, more behavior changes, more behavior problems than kids who had what we call orthopedic injuries, so injuries just to uh, an arm or a leg, but not to the head, for example, or to kids who were, you know, healthy kids from the community with no injuries. And so this was somewhat surprising to us, but we found that six months after, and th these changes in behavior were not explained just by the fact that the kids had behavior problems before the injury. There was a substantial increase after the injury. So we're concerned in these younger kids that there might be, a, you know, these behavior changes might take longer to, to resolve. Very interesting. So we know that young children's brains need protection and not all concussions can be prevented, but many can be avoided. Um, by following some safety tips. So what would you recommend to parents or to um, practitioners that are talking with parents about some of the prevention tips around concussion, particularly again, in children under five? So I'd start with uh, re repeating the same prevention tips we say to older children. So things like wearing a helmet when you're biking, uh, for example, or skiing. And these days, there's uh, been quite an increase at the moment in uh, head injuries and other injuries due to sliding. Uh, so we're also recommending that kids wear a helmet when they slide. There's often obstacles when they slide down hills. Those, those are things that are applicable at any age. But parents and practitioners should also be more aware and careful of what most people might call baby proofing uh, around the home. Uh, so we say baby proofing, but baby proofing, you know, you could apply that at least until five years of age, sometimes older. Um, there are a lot of dangers around the home and a lot of the injuries that happen at a young age are preventable. Um, things like the change table, uh, babies rolling off the change table and getting hurt. This is a very frequent type of injury and one that can be avoided. Um, uh, the staircase you mentioned in your list, and that is also a frequent thing. So having a gate, even if your child can go down the stairs, they might not be as steady as an older as an older child or an adult. So keeping that gate on for a little bit longer, for example. Um, shopping carts. Uh, we have a lot of kids in our studies who are injured falling off of shopping carts. You know, just as parents turn around for an instance to grab something off a shelf, for example. Um, these may seem like common sense recommendations to, to most of us, but, you know, we have to remember that parents are busy and uh, things can happen very quickly. I mentioned the babies and the change table, you know, you can turn around for just one second and that was the, the wrong time to turn. So I think it's worth repeating those recommendations, even if they do seem like common sense to most people. Just for our listeners that maybe don't understand the term baby proofing or home safety, using the equipment that's available to you, using the straps that are provided. We need to keep them engaged in their environment, right? So if they are crawling and playing, like what can we put in the environment that they can navigate that space safely, right? We, we don't want to 
keep them from just or just keep them sitting there and not doing anything right so right. as a parent at really questioning what's hazardous what's really dangerous in the environment and what changes can you make in your home or in the space where the child is to to prevent those serious injuries one of the things that you mentioned was around helmets um we've heard uh from uh, people in the that are working on concussions across the lifespan that helmets don't necessarily prevent concussions could you speak to that a little bit well th that that is true that, that uh there are a lot of factors that that go into whether there's a concussion or not and uh, i meant to mention this in a previous point but we also have to remind people that not all bumps to the head are concussions. So, so the, the concussion really has to be associated with some of those symptoms that I, that I mentioned and has to result in a, in a change to the brain's structure or functioning. Um, so, so just get that out of the way at the beginning uh, uh, to, 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 to make people aware of that. Uh, because as you said, too, kids fall all the time, right? <laughs> they, they fall, they bump their head, it's not necessarily a concussion. Um, helmets don't necessarily prevent them, but they can reduce the severity of them. Um, so kids might still have an injury that, that warrants medical investigation or follow up and things like that. But um, often they'll avoid a, a more serious injury in that sense. So um, and, you know, I, I really like your point, too, about keeping kids active and not preventing them from doing those things that kids really need to do. I, I often get asked the question about um playground structures you know kids fall from playground structures and so uh you know the recommendation is not to not let kids play on playground structures but to be aware of the age appropriate uh rule you know recommendations of them sometimes young kids play on structures that are too too old or too high for their age or their motor abilities and so i think that also goes with your point of using the equipment in a way that it's meant to be used and uh and and just keeping your eye out for what potential dangers there might be. What would you say to someone, um, you know, if they suspect their child has fallen from a, a height that was was too much for the, their child's age, and they think that they may have had a concussion? So um, parents and caregivers around them need to need to be experts in a way, right? They need to first of all stay calm, <laughs> and then. Uh, really look for those overt signs. If they see an overt sign, if their child is unconscious, they need to seek medical attention immediately. That's something that people will recognize and see. If their child is repeating vomit, uh, repeatedly vomiting, that's a clear sign. There's no question. You know, they can go to the emergency room. After that, they have to they have to be in in some ways the detective and be aware of the signs and symptoms. And aware, we're talking today about the younger kids, and a bit be aware, pardon, about how those uh, symptoms might manifest in a young child. So they need to be looking for those telltale signs, changes in behavior um, that they they think, well, that's not my child. That doesn't seem like my child. So any of the other symptoms, of course, if their child verbally, you know, says any of those symptoms, then that's another sign they need to seek medical attention. But otherwise, they really need to be monitoring and observing their child. And, you know, in a way, we put a lot of onus on them. But their parents are good judges of how their child is supposed to be. In the first hours and days, the parents need to be looking for those signs and symptoms and uh, of the manifestations. Also in young children, excessive crying, you know, the, not, the child not being able to be comforted. They're crying much more than they, they, than they would usually um that's that's another that's another sign you know a lot of the things i've said to you are things that most parents would say are actually frequent behaviors of everyday life right children two-year-olds you know they're irritable <laughs> they throw tantrums they cry um they you know they could be impulsive things like that but we're really looking for changes and things that that are out of the ordinary i'd say I love what you said about parents being detectives, investigating, being curious about what's going on. And we do believe that parents and caregivers know their children best. I agree. <laughs> I agree. And in terms of the recommendations, again, we're at this stage where we don't always have recommendations that are very specific to the early childhood. First of all, that the recommendations are similar to in older children uh, and adolescents in that um, 
you, you want the child to have initial an initial period of rest, you know, 24 to 48 hours of, of, of rest time. I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then a gradual return to activities that the child can tolerate. So in older kids, we'll say, well, if they're returning to activities, and they're feeling like it increases their symptoms, then that's too much and they need to scale back again and have another bit of rest time and, and go back. Of course, in young kids, again, it's challenging, you know, how you get a young child to rest. But often if they're experiencing symptoms, they will, uh, they will not engage in as many uh, activities or as active um, play or, or they won't want to do those things. So again, parents need to be aware of that and suggest activities that are a little bit quieter reading or playing a game that is not as physically effortful or mentally effortful as, as the child might normally engage in. One other thing I would say as a re recommendation that's really important that, at these young ages is for parents to take care of themselves. We have found repeatedly in our studies that parental mental state, stress, anxiety, for instance, is really influential in how the child recovers. So a uh, recommendation to parents is, is that if you know their young child being injured can be overwhelming to them it can cause anxiety and stress and they or they might have that you know before their child got injured so if people if parents feel that they're overwhelmed by the situation we really do encourage them to reach out themselves and get help uh, and and encourage them to do so because it will also help their child that is an excellent point that I didn't really consider. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and so the last question that I had for you is just what are some resources that you would recommend to parents or caregivers um, for children under the age of five in managing and preventing concussion? Yeah. So for the moment, and I'm being completely honest here, most of the recommendations and the guidelines that have been uh, published or, or shared with the community are, are, have been really based on science in school-aged children and adolescents. And that's most of what we have at the moment. I'd say a majority of those recommendations are, are completely applicable to young children as well. So people shouldn't hesitate to be familiar with those. Each province has uh, you know, guidelines and resources such as your own institute, the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute, where there'll be information. Uh, you've gone a step further in, in really tailoring things to young children. And I think that will be coming, you know, across the country and, and internationally uh, more and more so. Um, pediatric hospitals and, and community centres all have uh, often a set of uh, resources about concussion. Um, I do believe that in the coming years, we'll see more and more about it specifically to injuries in young children. Uh, there's a lot of emerging research and a lot more awareness that's coming out about the, the frequency of those injuries and the fact that young children, just like their older counterparts, are, are, can be vulnerable to these injuries and need to be thought about in, in a slightly different manner. We talked today about the, the possible behavioral changes that might be really distinct to this developmental period to early childhood. And I think there's uh, increasing awareness about that. In our group, we're putting together um, uh, a website, uh, a part of our website um, uh, that's going to be coming out in the, in the coming next, I'd say, four to six months uh, that will have some information for families uh, about the specificity of uh, early childhood uh, concussion and traumatic brain injuries and information and videos and fact sheets uh, that will be specific to them and that's based on on the, the scientific work we've been doing. That's wonderful to hear and we'll certainly put up all the links to any resources that that we can um, attach to this video. Um, so thank you very much for your time and your expertise and the work that you're doing in this area. We truly appreciate it. It's really my pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you so very much.